we recording now? Okay, cool. Well, my name's Rick. Uh, I used to live in New York. I don't anymore. So it's like 6 a.m. local time. I moved to California, so I'm very tired. Hence the chair. Uh, I'm going to give a talk. It's, if you couldn't guess already, it's pretty extemporaneous. Uh, the title is By the Dip, because I needed a title. So I, I, for those of you who may not, oh, by a show of hands, I like to, I like, to like interact with the audience. How, how many of you have, are familiar with the By the Dip meme? All right, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the By the Dip meme, it's actually like a pre-meme meme. It is a uh, sort of idiomatic statement from finance when a security or asset that you're buying um, experiences a price dip, as they like to call it, well, that's when you buy it. You just buy the dip. And then someone made this like animal animation that's really good about buying the dip. And I'm going to summarize it, but basically it's a guy swearing a lot and telling someone to buy the dip. It's his computer voice. It's great. You should just go look it up on the internet. And um, and basically, it's like, well, when your friends buy the dip too, and you've bought the dip first, that's how buying the dip works. Like, you're fine as long as you tell your friends to also buy the dip after you've bought the dip. Then you're fine, and there's no issue. And this is like a, a central tenet of like, of like retail investing. Um, when I first started getting into the blockchain space, and I was meeting real traders who worked at banks for the first time. I had done some trading myself, but I didn't work at a bank. Um, I'd ask them, what book? Like, how, where do you guys learn about trading? Like, I've, I'm, my mom's a research librarian. I grew up in libraries at universities, like, looking up stuff. I'm very comfortable looking up stuff. And I was like, I've looked everywhere. I can't find a book on trading anywhere. And everyone always said one book. There's one book on trading. And it's the reminiscences of a stock operator. And that guy is from like the 1800s and he's basically talking about buy the dip, right? I mean, he's basically saying the same thing. He's like, you know, you sell when the market's going up, you buy when the market's going down. If you can figure that out, you've won. And it's like, so it's not a thick, it's not like a thick book. It's like, it's a couple hundred pages of this guy basically saying that over and over and over and over again. Um, and it's a, it's a good read, but that's, I just told you the whole book. So... Um, so this talk is about a couple of different things, a, b a bunch of tweets I've had over time, and I, I, gave an, I wrote myself an outline, but I'm obviously not following it. Um, but basically, you start there. You start with traders buy the dip. Good traders understand you sell when the market's going up, you buy when the market's going down, you just wa ride the waves, you're just, you're just you know counter to what other people are doing, and that's how you make money. You just, you're just you know, running in front of the bulls, right? Um, and then you have Bitcoin, right? So, so, so you have all these people who were uh, retail investors from the 90s. Bitcoin happens. They're like, wow, I can like really like ride the waves like for real, for real. Like we're surfing in Hawaii. Like we can really take it there. And and that's deeply embedded in the psyche or the or the zeitgeist of of Bitcoin, and then and then these brilliant people, uh, uh, I mean that not pejoratively, honestly, brilliant people uh, make Ethereum, and they're like, wow, we can raise millions of dollars with this funny money to make even funnier money, um, and so they do that, and so deep embedded in that culture is. Well, we all know about buying the dip. We all know about funny money. We all know about trading. Let's do that. Then, so Bitcoin has this very, frankly, it's easy to lose sight. It's been 10 years or whatever. It's easy to get confused. There's crazy people yelling on Twitter, and they sometimes will yell at you in person if you dare find them in person. And so it's easy to lose sight of what Bitcoin's really about. But Bitcoin is a single application chain. Uh, because it's the first chain, we don't think of categorizing it that way. But it's, it's basically a payments network. And, um, and even though they have, you know, debates to the death whether it's a store of value or an exchange or a medium of exchange, at the end of the day, 
everyone kind of agrees, well, you know, I mean, there's lunatics everywhere, but basically all the sane people agree that in order for Bitcoin to work, it has to do some of both of those things. It's kind of irrefutable. It, it has to store some value and it has to do some medium of exchange or else neither one of those features actually works, right? So when you're having a dispute in Bitcoin and, you're, and remember in the back of your mind, you're always trying to buy the dip. So when things aren't going well and there's some dispute and there's something going on, at the end of the day in the Bitcoin community, you can say, are we making it a better store of value? Yes or no? Are we making it a better medium of exchange? Yes or no? And that's gonna like ground the dispute. But because Ethereum happened after Bitcoin and is more than Bitcoin necessarily in some meaningful way, and I'll get back to what that means, um, Bitcoin, Ethereum kind of loses that grounding, right? So if you look at the Ethereum narrative, it, it very much uh, starts with this sort of medium of exchange narrative of Bitcoin, well, we can just augment the medium of exchange capabilities of Bitcoin with this more programmable money. Then you sort of have this world computer narrative. Then we, we sort of end up in this sort of weird ICO narrative. And these narratives, each one of these narratives represents, you know, this inflection point of like, oh, more money's coming in, right? And if you actually look at the chart, you can see like different narratives and different things that happen, like EEA, like 10xing Ethereum. Um, and so Ethereum has this history where um, when things, when, when you see the dip, not only do you buy, but you, you change the narrative. You, you have this, the memes shift. When, when the, you have this short dip, you, you, you know, shouts out to Andrew Keys, you like shift the narrative, you do some EEA thing, the price 10 X is, you bought the dip, it's awesome, everything's awesome. We've got private jets now, we've got personal helicopters to get to the private jets, everything's awesome, right? And Ethereum has done this in five years, has done this multiple times. And, and you can really, if you've been paying attention and, and you didn't get totally you know, disoriented, you see that these narratives have changed and, and they represent um, some attempt to repair the price. It's very conscientious, it's very methodical, it's, it's, very or, it's, it's decentralized, but it's also very organized. So we see people adopt these memes and um, an and attempt to uh, uh, you know, boost the price, 10x the price. I mean, the idea with every meme is like 10x the price, um, at least, right? And, uh, and so we're at a, a point now with Ethereum, um, all these years later, where uh, you know, there is no world computer. Um, ICOs have basically stopped. Um, you know, you know uh, smart money on top of Bitcoin didn't, you know, that was abandoned a long time ago, so that didn't really happen. Um, we do sort of, we do, we have sort of cycled back into this uh, programmable money thing with DeFi, uh, money Legos, or what's the, there's some Legos somewhere in there, I don't know what the other part is, but like money Legos, right? But, um, but the problem is, unlike Bitcoin, there's no real floor, there's no real narrative grounding. So, when we talk about money Legos, people make those, and, and we see these sort of, um, my background's in systems administration, and, 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 it's, and, it's, and I'm, I'm older than I look, uh, you know, I was doing it in the 90s, and, um, and you know, we used to call it, you know, you know getting, wreck, you know, wrecking shit. You know, pe people would, you know, crack into your system and you got wrecked, you know, you, you got owned, right? And, um, you know, I'm talking to people and it's like, it's sort of trippy to me. It's like, yeah, like people were out, I was out owning shit and you weren't even born, right? So like, this is kind of an awkward conversation, but like your shit got owned, right? I mean, if you look at these um, DeFi products, it's not that they're, um, I mean, there's a lot, in, in private I've said it, I'll say it here, it's, it's, not a, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, these are people who are learning what financial engineering is for the first time as 23 year olds by building products on Ethereum. That's the current meme. Uh, that doesn't sound very sustainable to me. Um, it, it, it sounds, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't even call it a recipe for disaster because there's no like recipe, it's just disaster. You just, you, you're just, 
jumped right into the lava pit and you're melting and you don't it's so hot you don't even know that your legs are gone because it, you're just burning you're just it's so that i don't think is going to be the narrative shift the mimetic shift that saves ethereum that that takes us back to a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or two thousand dollars i i don't i don't see relying on an army of um, well-intentioned, naive young adults um, um, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars to each other due to typos um, as a great uh, growth strategy. Um, and and uh, like I said at the beginning, this talk's all bad news pretty much. So, um, so that's, uh, you know, in scene, that's act one. Um, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that the, that the that that narrative is going to um, support us. And so you sort of say, okay, well, those of us who are committed to the community, those of us who have invested in the community, are firm believers in the community, well, what, what other narratives are available um, to save us? And there's this sort of, to me, um, as someone who, uh, for better or worse, is immersed in the technical discussions of Ethereum, say, well, there's this ETH2 narrative. I've been very critical of ETH2 over the years. Uh, my last talk, I think I said it's the spec is on a napkin, which you know they've gotten rid of the napkin. There's actually a blog you can like read. There's Wikipedia and stuff or wiki articles. You, you know, you, there's a spec there, but I still think that the ETH2 narrative is insufficient because the problem with the ETH2 narrative is that um, it sort of in a fantasy world calls itself ETH2 while ignoring ETH1 almost completely. So if ETH1X doesn't succeed, if ETH1X doesn't solve state growth, if ETH1X doesn't provide state rent, if ETH1X doesn't solve all these really hard problems, then ETH2 can't work. Then there's no path from existing smart contracts and existing ETH tokens to an ETH2 network. Or I, I gave a talk in Berlin at Web3, or I moderated a panel, where I, I tried to like slide this into my moderation, I was like, hey guys, uh, I operate ETH1 nodes. If I can't like switch a config flag to start running ETH2 nodes, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna just run another chain. I'm just, I'm just gonna run Polkadot or something. Like, like if, if, if what makes ETH2 ETH2 is the fact that it somehow relates to ETH1 in some deep and meaningful way, like, like as a product, right? And so, um, if we so the ETH2 narrative that we see now, I think, is very appealing to people who um, um, idolize genius and idolized Vitalik's genius and and have are betting on Vitalik's genius as somehow saving them. And I'm not making any claims uh, one way or the other about Vitalik's genius. He's obviously very talented and very capable, but that's not enough to save the whole community. You can't just put the whole community on Vitalik's back and expect that that's going to work. Um, that's not a good. That's just not a good strategy, um, and so I'm I'm very skeptical that. Well, I'm extremely skeptical that the ETH2 narrative that from three months ago or six months ago is going to save us. I think that uh, one of the the magical things that I see happen with Vitalik is that he will completely change something, and no one gets upset. Everyone's just like, oh, Vitalik changed his mind, and it's okay. So. I'm sure that between now and when ETH2 actually launches, Vitalik will have changed his mind and something reasonable will have happened. But, um, but I think that reasonable thing is ETH1X, right? My, my sort of hypothesis is that ETH1X, um, you know, solving the statelessness problems and these other problems, account abstraction is another one. These things that are imperative to be solved, they'll be solved. I think ORUs or optim optimistic rollups and, and ZK rollups as well to a certain extent, although I'm more bearish on ZK rollups uh, because of the computational costs. But rollups as well, I think if you take ETH1X and you take rollups, that's actually a path to ETH2. And, and I think that the narrative shift will be that we actually do it that way. We actually implement rollups and we implement this stuff, and then one day someone says, surprise, remember when roll-ups were part of ETH2? And everyone says, yes, we remember when roll-ups were part of ETH2, and, and then we have ETH2, and, and everyone's happy. But it's worth noting that that narrative 
is going to be fundamentally different than the narrative we have today. And in order for that narrative, I think, to be successful, we have to sort of acknowledge that um, you have to make a decision. Is, uh, you know, what is Ethereum? Is Ethereum uh, a product um, for developers to build applications? Is Ethereum a, a, a marketplace for validators so that validators can find customers and then engage with those customers who are the DAP developers? Is Ethereum uh, magic internet money? Is Ethereum money Legos? Is Ethereum um, you know, the world computer? We have to pick one. And, and I think that for me, looking at the community, um, it's that not picking of one that has really uh, put us in a sort of an, an awkward um, situation that we're in today. Um, so that was it. Oh, I guess I have some other points that aren't super relevant. Um, you know, ETH2 sounds more and more like Cosmos every day. That's, that's one of my points. Um, which, you know, pros and cons, I think Polkadot obviously took a lot from Cosmos um, and then didn't add much, frankly. Um, but yeah, I think that that's pretty much everything. I'm happy to uh, spend the rest of the time having a conversation with the audience. Um, yeah, and here's the guy at the mic. Yeah, go right here. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> it's good to, to hear sometimes some bad news. I mean, we are always positive in the in this community. I mean, at least for uh, speaking for myself. For, so it's good to hear kind of an opposite view. I, I'm one of those uh, 23 years old guys. And uh, thank you for <laughs> talking about us. Uh, you know, like earlier at lunch, I was talking to some uh, other volunteers like me. And I was like, yeah, I would love to stay in this industry for the next 10 years, you know? And I have this kind of long-term vision. And since I was born in the second half of the 90s and you were already in New York City working, like, do you think it's a good idea to have a long-term vision in this industry? Like, uh, just a personal advice. Like, do you think it's, it's, it's a good point or it's risky? Like, what do you think? That's a really interesting question. Not at all what I was expecting when I titled this talk by the dip, but I'm happy to answer it. Um, so I, I started working in 98, 99. Um, the job that I had at the time, I was a systems administrator. This is totally relevant to your question. Um, I was working as a systems administrator uh, or a system administrator. Uh, that S got you $20,000 extra uh, looking at uh, job posts, so it's very important. Um, and that job basically doesn't exist anymore. Um, AWS, uh, general automation, virtualization. Um, I'm kind of the, at 38, I'm basically one of the youngest people you'll see who would identify as a systems administrator. So um, my parents are like ancient professions. My dad's a lawyer, that's been around forever. My mom's a librarian, that's probably been around for at least as long, if not longer. Um, they always had a way of getting a job from acquiring those skills. I think that the skills that I acquired in systems administration will always be useful. I'll always be able to, I can do DevOps work. Um, it, it's um, a little uh, uncomfortable at times because of the uh, sort of narrative shift, but, um, but on the technical side of the work, I can always do it. And so I think that as long as you're acquiring a real skill, like a concrete skill, you'll always be able to get a job. Um, and, and there's also the question, if you're in the blockchain space, about wealth accumulation. Like if you're actually, and, and another thing I've tweeted recently is people don't know what real property is, and uh, you're in Europe, so civil law is a little different than common law, but like real property is like land and the stuff that you build on land. Um, and you know, a security or like intellectual property is like quite literally not real property. And so when you talk about wealth, we're talking about real property. And like how far away is crypto from real property? Like it's not even respect, it's not, it doesn't even have protection under the law, right? Like there's no law stopping uh, Justin Sun from tricking Binance into crashing your, your, your network, right? There, so when you're working, like presumably you're working A, to sustain yourself, 
but also hopefully some aspiration towards towards wealth creation. And so as long as you're thinking about how does this job further my skills or get me actual wealth, like real, like real property, um, you'll be fine. Um, and so I, I can, the snarky response is, you know, if you're, if you're marketing, you better be good at it. If you're sales, you better be good at it because, you know, eventually this market's going to collapse and all the snake oil bullshit is not going to exist. And if you're a coder, like, actually learn I, I mean, it, it just, it, it breaks my heart. Like, like learn real programming. Like, actually learn real stuff. Like, and that's not about the blockchain space. That's about JavaScript. There's this thing called, like, I think it's JAMS. And, and I don't even remember what it stands for anymore. It was some crazy thing where it was basically, like, somebody had to marketize and productize building a static website. They had to like they had to like make like a meme about like this is how static websites work like you don't need a database to run a static website because people don't learn computer science they don't learn like the actual first principles and fundamentals and so they sort of screw themselves because they don't really have skills so that was a long way of saying like acquire skills uh, and you'll be fine do we have any other questions or comments maybe more about crypto well can we just go in order of like front to back uh, what's your view on the day trading and um, w yeah what do you think of that broadly speaking um, having lived in New York for I lived there for 11 years a lot of the people you met I met there were, were traders uh, day trading is fine um, apropos of my thing about work right it's uh, it's not I tried it a little bit, not really. It was very unappealing to me. Um, I'm the kind of person, I, I frankly, I, what I do now is I talk to people about mechanism design, which is a very abstract and bizarre business. If I could make the same kind of living as a carpenter, I would absolutely, which to a certain extent I could have. I, um, the stone stonemasons in the United States uh, drive Ferraris, you know. I mean, they're, they're very well off. If you, if, you, if you can actually build a stone castle for someone in the United States, the people who want that can usually afford to pay you. Um, so yeah, I mean, day trading's fine. It's, it's a fine profession, um, but it's also very risky and, and not really what you should build a whole community on, uh, a nascent community. And then there was a person in the back. And where did Chris go? Did Chris leave? Or is Chris somewhere? Oh, he, yeah, yeah. he left. So I'm kind of surprised to hear you say that Ethereum is looking more like Cosmos every day. Why do you say that? Ethereum 2. Yeah, yeah Ethereum 2. Um, because at some point, uh, I spent a lot of time recently at, um, I've, I've been involved in Tendermint for a long time. I, <laughs> I was just talking out in the hall, one of my, um, PRs was actually pulled, was actually, I, I added a feature to Tendermint many years ago that was recently removed, um, or I paid someone to write the code, anyway. Um, um, why, how is Ethereum 2 looking like Cosmos? Because there's, it's an important point, but I think it, it sort of represents minutia, that there's a difference between sidechain security and sharded security. So the security guarantees that you get from your shard are very different than the security guarantees that you get from a side chain. But like we can add at some intellectual level, we can have that conversation, we can talk about those features, but like does CryptoKitties give a shit? Like no. Like they don't care that it's a side chain or a shard. They don't care about that security guarantee. If we're gonna have people selling their house on their own REIT on the blockchain, that person isn't gonna care whether it's a shard or a side chain. And so once you break through the sort of language barrier uh, of the different projects, you know, IBC is uh, inner blockchain communication is this sort of all encompassing umbrella that Cosmos has, but it's such a deep, like, which I think is a pro and a con, but you know, you, when you map the terms over uh, a Cosmos zone and an ORU are almost identical. And so, once you remove, there was this idea in ETH2 that I immediately rallied against, and it was in Prague, so whatever DevCon that was, um, where basically when a shard was under load, 
consensus would rotate which validators worked that shard? Well, just computer science and game, very simple game theory tells you that that can't work. Because if the, uh, in, a, in a BFT environment, in an adversarial environment, because what will happen is the adversary knows where they're placing the load, the adversary is looking at the entire chain, the adversary uh, will be controlling your load balancing. And that's a horrible outcome, right? So you have to remove that. You have to have a bottom-up system. And so, um, so I, I described that years ago as app sharding in, in private conversations. I don't write blogs or whatever. So, um, and so app sharding is just a very intuitive concept. It's just like an app chain, just like Bitcoin. Like if you just have a bunch of individual chains that have their own sovereignty that are for a particular application, and then you link them together somehow, um, I think that actually works. Whereas when you have this top-down sharding, which to me is the, the at a high level in an abstract, the main difference, sharding is top-down, uh, you know, uh, Cosmos style is sort of bottom-up. I think that you get this robustness from bottom-up that you don't get from top-down. And so ultimately, when you're working through it, you I understand the inclination for starting top-down, but as you chip away at it, you know, working through the mechanisms, you're going to end up with a bottom-up mechanism anyway because that's, people have to have, you know, it's, uh, this might be a little too abstract to be useful for a computer scientist, but people have to maintain their sovereignty. These, these communities that define these blockchains have to maintain their sovereignty. Um, and so that's why I, I see ETH2 becoming more like Cosmos every day. Uh, and then there was another question, and Chris seems to have left. Am, am, I, am I out of time? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm happy to answer them outside. Um, there's, I think, two of you, and I know Chris. We work together, so he can ask me whenever he wants. Um, thank you, folks. <laughs>